Sunday, September 15th, 1963. 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama. Four Ku Klux Klan members planted over a dozen sticks of dynamite attached to a timing device beneath the steps of the church. At around 10.22 a.m., the bomb exploded in the back stairwell of the church. The explosion killed four girls, Denise McNair, Carol Robertson, Cynthia Dion Wesley, and Addie Mae Collins. Over 20 other people were injured from the explosion. As a key civil rights meeting place, this church was a frequent target of bomb threats. Within seven hours of the bombing, two black boys in Birmingham were shot to death. Johnny Robinson was shot with a shotgun in the back by Birmingham police officer Jack Parker. Virgil Lamar Ware was shot with a pistol by Larry Joe Sims and Michael Lee Farley. These children, unoffending, innocent, and beautiful, were the victims of one of the most vicious and tragic crimes ever perpetrated against humanity. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Segregation is the act of separating people historically on the basis of race and or gender. Segregation implies the physical separation of people in everyday activities, in professional life, and in the exercise of civil rights. The European Commission defines segregation as the act by which a natural or legal person separates other persons on the basis of race, color, language, religion, nationality, or national or ethnic origin without an objective and reasonable justification. Segregation can exist de jure, or in law, or de facto, in practice. De jure segregation in the United States was based on laws against miscegenation, such as interracial marriages, see Loving v. Virginia, and laws against hiring people of the targeted ethnicity for jobs. After the abolition of slavery by the promulgation of the 13th Amendment, racial discrimination in the southern United States was governed by Jim Crow laws that imposed strict segregation of the races. In Plessy v. Ferguson, rendered on May 18, 1896, the Supreme Court authorized southern states to impose racial segregation by law, provided that the conditions offered to the various racial groups by such segregation were equal a doctrine known as separate but equal. This de jure segregation continued until the 1960s. In Brown v. Board of Education, Brown 1, rendered on May 17, 1954, the Supreme Court held racial segregation in public schools unconstitutional under the 14th Amendment, even though the service rendered therein was claimed to be of equal quality. The ruling in Brown 1 did not list or specify a particular method or way of how to proceed in ending racial segregation in schools. The court's ruling in Brown 2, 1955, demanded states to desegregate with all deliberate speed. These cases acted as the end of the separate but equal doctrine in the United States.
April 1963, known today as the Birmingham Campaign, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights, Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth, and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. joined together for a massive campaign directed against Birmingham's segregation system by placing pressure on its merchants during the Easter season, the second biggest shopping season of the year. This campaign consisted of sit-ins, marches on City Hall, a boycott of downtown merchants, voter registration drives, and mass meetings where Dr. King spoke about his philosophy of nonviolence, its methods, and for volunteers for this campaign. The city retaliated by arresting hundreds of protesters. The city obtained an injunction against the protests. After heavy debate, the leaders of this campaign decided to disobey the court order and continue the protests. We cannot in good conscience obey such an injunction, which is an unjust, undemocratic, and unconstitutional misuse of the legal process. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. April 12, 1963, Dr. King was arrested in Birmingham in violation of the injunction and was placed into solitary confinement. From there, Dr. King wrote, Letter from Birmingham Jail. By April 20th, 1963, Dr. King was released after bail money was available. A new strategy to include young persons in protest was proposed. On May 2nd, 1963, over 1,000 African-American students attempted to march into downtown Birmingham. Hundreds were arrested. Photographs and videos of officers beating children with clubs, blasted by high-pressure fire hoses, and attacked by police dogs spread nationwide on televisions and newspapers. On May 8, 1963, Dr. King accepted a compromise to halt the demonstrations on request of negotiators and by May 10, 1963, an agreement was reached with a series of acts to pave the way toward desegregation known as the Birmingham Truce Agreement. The city agreed to desegregate lunch counters, restrooms, drinking fountains, and fitting rooms, to hire African Americans in stores as salesmen and clerks, and to release the jailed demonstrators. Segregationists violently retaliated with a series of violent attacks. May 1st, 1963. The Gaston Motel, where Dr. King and other leaders were previously staying, was destroyed by explosives. The next day, the home of Alfred Daniel King, Dr. King's brother, was also attacked. August 20th, 1963. NAACP attorney Arthur Shores' house was firebombed and again on September 4, 1963 for trying to help integrate the Birmingham public schools. Birmingham Governor George Wallace used the Alabama National Guard to block court-ordered desegregation of public schools in Birmingham. September 9, 1963, President John F. Kennedy federalized the Alabama National Guard and sent them to desegregate the University of Alabama. Less than a week later, Klan members bombed Birmingham 16th Street Baptist Church. stopped at exactly 10.22 a.m. The only surviving stained glass window in the church's east wall is of an image of Jesus, but with the face knocked out.
The FBI conducted an investigation and in 1968 narrowed their list of primary suspects to four known Klansmen and segregationists, Robert Edward Chambliss, Thomas Edwin Blanton Jr., Bobby Frank Cherry, and Herman Frank Cash. The official reason why prosecutors did not indict any of the suspects until years later was due to insufficient evidence to convict the perpetrators as witnesses were reluctant to talk, physical evidence was lacking, and FBI surveillance information was believed inadmissible. In 1971, Alabama Attorney General Bill Baxley reopened the case. Mr. Baxley built trust with reluctant witnesses to come forth to testify and discovered that much of the evidence accumulated by the FBI had not been disclosed to county prosecutors under orders of FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover. November 14, 1977. Robert Chambliss was convicted of murder and sentenced to several terms of life imprisonment. May 1, 2001. Thomas Blanton was convicted and sentenced to four life sentences in prison. May 22, 2002. Bobby Frank Cherry was convicted of four counts of murder. Herman Cash passed away on February 7, 1994, and was never prosecuted for the murders. Birmingham Police Department officer Jack Parker was never indicted for the fatal shooting of Johnny Robinson. Although the FBI tried to reopen the case in 2009, it was ultimately decided that the Bureau could not indict anyone in the case as Officer Parker was already deceased. Officer Parker died in 1977. Larry Joe Sims and Michael Lee Farley were arrested and charged with first-degree murder. In 1964, an all-white jury convicted Sims of second-degree murder. Farley later pleaded guilty to the same. Both were sentenced to seven months in jail. However, the sentence was suspended by the judge and the boys were released, only serving probation until 1965. Decades later, in 1997, Farley reached out to the Ware's family to apologize. Sims called in 2003. Eighteen seventy three. The first black church in Birmingham was formed under the name the First Colored Baptist Church of Birmingham, Alabama. The congregation originally worshipped in different buildings before finally settling into its present location in eighteen eighty. In eighteen eighty four, a brick building was erected to house the church, but in nineteen oh eight the city of Birmingham condemned the building and ordered it to be torn down. Mr. Wallace Rayfield, the state's only black architect, was commissioned by the church officials to design a new building. With T.C. Winham, a black contractor from Birmingham, the church was built and completed in 1911. A central stronghold in fighting against the evils of segregation, the church provided much needed strength and safety for black men, women, and children. As one of the few primary institutions that belong to the African American community, the church provided a safe social center and lecture hall where famous African-American guests would be able to speak and engage with this community, such as W.E.B. Du Bois, Mary McLeod Bethune, Paul Robeson, and Ralph Bunch. It was thus given the nickname Everybody's Church, inviting African-Americans from across the city and neighboring towns to take part in its programs and activities. The church's location being near downtown Birmingham's commercial district, municipal buildings and parks, in addition to having one of the largest auditoriums available to the African Americans in Birmingham, made it an ideal central meeting place and rallying point for civil rights protests, demonstrations, petitions, and campaigns. On September 15, 1963, at approximately 10.22 a.m., an explosive planted by at least four Klansmen exploded, killing four girls and injuring more than 20 other people. Later that day, two boys were shot to death. For the African American community in Birmingham, such acts of terrorism were commonplace. Nearby, along the city's color line on Center Avenue, 
Explosions of African-American homes were common for decades, giving that area the nickname Dynamite Hill. It was common for these homes to also be targeted for drive-by shootings. Despite the non-stop terrorism against African-American families, many held their ground for the larger political war against racism and segregation. The bombing at the church was less than three weeks after Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s famous I Have a Dream speech in Washington, D.C. With news of the bombing reaching national headlines, federal involvement in Alabama became increased, and the following protests and demonstrations gained further national tension and pressure toward Washington. The next year in 1964, the Civil Rights Act was passed, followed by the Voting Rights Act in 1965, making literacy tests and poll taxes illegal. After repairs to the church were funded with over $300,000 in unsolicited gifts from around the country, the church reopened the following year on June 7, 1964. Throughout the years, the church has gone through several renovations and restorations, including addressing persistent water damage, exterior brick-facing failure, and water a stained glass window depicting a black Jesus with his arms spread wide and one hand pushing away, designed by John Petz and gifted by the country of Wales, remains installed and displayed in the church to this day. The hand pushing away symbolizes the black community's efforts to stop oppression and injustice. The other hand facing palm up symbolizes the unfathomable ability to forgive in the face of so much hate. On June 16, 1976, the church was added to the Alabama Register of Landmarks and Heritage. On September 17, 1980, the church was added to the National Register of Historic Places. On January 12, 2017, President Barack Obama declared the church as part of the Birmingham Civil Rights National Monument. In October 2019, the church was chosen for inclusion in the African American Civil Rights Network for its enduring connection to the black freedom struggle. Today, the church is part of the Birmingham Civil Rights District and receives more than 200,000 visitors annually and an average weekly attendance of nearly 2,000. The current pastor is the Reverend Arthur Price. The church offers several programs, such as Christian education, youth ministry, congregational care, and fellowship. The 16th Street Baptist Church offers tours of its historic grounds, led by docents that lead visitors on guided tours to the many spots of significance in and around the church. Exhibits cover the walls, providing information on the history of the church, Jim Crow, segregation in Birmingham, and the lives of the children that were so suddenly and horrifically torn away. A commemorative plaque outside the building shows the exact location the dynamite detonated. Visitors can also walk in the basement where the four little girls gathered before the bomb detonated. Tours with groups up to 30 people can be booked online at www.16thstreetbaptist.org slash tours. For groups larger than 30 people, a special request will need to be made. At the time of this writing, tours are $10 per adult, $5 per student, and no fee for children under 6 years old. Tours are booked in one-hour time slots from 10 a.m. as the first tour and 3 p.m. as the last tour of the day. 